Hi folks, welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm Justin Riley and I hope you stick around. We've got a great show for you today. Our topics are gonna to include learning how bourbon does not necessarily have to come from Kentucky, plus it's National Library Card Sign Up Month, and an opportunity for you to experience a haunted forest. But first, I am joined now by my good friend, Steve Benchwall from Wisconsin Business World. Steve, welcome back. Hey, great to be here. So um, school's gonna be starting up soon, which means that um, Mini Business World is coming up. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about what Mini Business World is. Sure, so Mini Business World is the school year version of our programming. Sure. And what we do is we get high school kids, and in some cases, middle school kids, engaged in a one day, more of a business conference. And we throw all sorts of business ideas and concepts at the kids and also let them have kind of a project where they get to be creative and and work together with some other kids and come up with a new invention that they want to sell and we kind of vote on what the best products are and the kids have a great time with it awesome and, and you had mentioned that it's not just for high school students sometimes middle school students can yeah so that was really exciting last year was the, f the first year that we tried it and we were a little bit nervous because historically we've only been with high school aged kids and sure. you know teenagers high school kids there's plenty of issues and, and problems sure. that we deal with so we were a little bit worried that you know middle school might, might might create some more issues too but we had an absolute blast with it the kids were, were so ready for it and the creativity and, and hard work that they showed was really inspiring and it was really cool too to see a lot of kids who maybe aren't quite as self-conscious as high school kids high school kids are sure. a little bit maybe worried more about how I look sure. or how I sound yeah. man those seventh graders that we had just dove right into it so yeah. they had a great time so now yeah. we're really proud to say that we can kind of offer middle school up through high school age programming to kind of match whatever our sponsors kind of want to see and where they want us to be that's very cool and I'm, I'm curious did they uh, do they come to you then do they get to skip school for a day and yeah that's they cool. Do. That's, that's a good incentive there, kids. Some of them, that's the highlight of it. You know, right. you get out of school for the day and kind of go to this cool place and have a fun day. So. That's awesome. So um, you talked a little bit about your sponsors. How do other businesses and sponsors play a role in your program? Sure. So sometimes they just want to get involved. They, they've heard about the program. They want to support the kids. Mm -hmm. But maybe they're not too comfortable participating beyond that. That's great. We can facilitate the event you sure. know, exclusively ourselves. But a lot of times what's really cool is sometimes those sponsors will also say, could we come be a guest speaker or could we come help the kids kind of brainstorm with their ideas? So each sponsor kind of has a different level of interest and a different time commitment that they're able to give. Um, so it kind of varies everywhere from us coming in and facilitating the whole thing to some businesses that say, hey, come into our office. We want to volunteer during the day. We want to be hands on with the kids. And, and those are kind of the coolest programs because for the kids, when they're able to see a real business, get in front of them and talk about what they do and what they were like when they were kids, it really helps to make it a real business experience, more authentic for the kids. Absolutely, and I know that we've talked about that before, how you have different businesses and business leaders coming in and, and working you know, more hands-on with the kids mm -hmm. and everything. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, so having held many business world programs for a few years now, how has the curriculum changed? And, and do you, I mean, obviously you've added middle school to it now. Mm -hmm. How do you anticipate that it's going to change in the future? Sure, so some of the things that are kind of exciting, we hear a lot of great Wisconsin-based companies that say, we don't necessarily need a four-year degree for our employees to work here. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's day and age, we've gotten so locked into, if you're uh, you know, a good student after high school, you're going to go to a four-year college. If that's the degree you want, if that's the career path you want to go down, awesome, go for it. But there's a lot of kids who kind of don't know, and they don't even know the options that are out there. So we get a lot of companies now, manufacturing companies specifically, that are saying, hey, we want to do a mini business world with a focus on advanced manufacturing and really show these kids that you can go to a two-year tech college, there'll be a job waiting for you, and you're going to make a great salary on top of it. So just kind of opening them up to their options and making sure that the kids at least know the choices that are out there before they make those tough decisions. And not just be thinking that they have to go to a four-year college because exactly. that's just what you do. Exactly. So that's very cool. Yep. So you know these kids uh, just finished up Mini Business World, or they're gonna you're gonna be doing mm -hmm. Mini Business World now that school started. What's the next step after they they complete that? Yeah. So we really hope that they enjoy Mini Business World. Like I said, it's just one day long, the length of a school day. And if they really like that experience, we hope that they choose to sign up for our summer camp. And we've been on talking about that a little bit um, back during the summer. So the viewers hopefully have heard about that summer program. But we get them in the summer for a full week, and we can really throw a lot more at them and, and give them a lot more information and kind of engage them in a college setting that's a little bit more productive to their future and, and what they're going to be doing down the road. Steve Benchwall from Wisconsin Business World, always a pleasure to talk with you. Great to be on. Thanks so much. Don't go away. When we come back, we'll be talking with Schuster's Playtime Farm. It's Talk of the Town. Stay right here. 
Welcome back to Talk of the Town. My next guest is Don Schuster from Schuster's Playtime Farm in Deerfield. Don, welcome. Well, thanks for having me in. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, so, how did you get started, or how did you get started in the fall harvest business? Um, I came home from work when I was 22 years ago, and I wanted to do something, so I put some pumpkins in the ground. There you go. It was a third of an acre. And uh, we've gone from a third of an acre to about 15 acres and going from, you know, a few people pulling the driveway, grabbing a few pumpkins to yeah. tens of thousands of people coming to the driveway. Wow. Grabbing a lot of pumpkins. So you literally have tens of thousands of pumpkins that you grow. I have tens of thousands of people oh, okay. coming to pick. <laughs> <You don't laughs> I, I probably grow, okay. you know, half a million pumpkins. Wow. Wow, so they don't, they don't even all get bought then? No. Wow. No. I don't mind because it's fertilizer, it goes back in the ground. Sure, yeah, it goes great back advertising. In the ground. Yeah, absolutely. People love to see pumpkins. So, you know, how long, you know, we've, we talked a little bit before the interview, like how long um, you've been doing this. Now, talk to us, talk to the viewers a little bit about how long you've been doing this. This has been, tw this will be our 22nd season. And I can wow. always remember that because uh, our first season, my youngest was nine years old and I stuck him in a pumpkin. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, it's been 22 years already. Wow. Wow. And we were talking a little bit beforehand about how um, you, you, the, the concept of agra, agra... Agritainment. Agritainment. There we go. I like that word. Agritainment. And how that kind of started out as an add-on to what you were already doing on your farm. And now it's kind of flipped and that's kind of become your bread and butter. Yes. I mean, you know, I bought our farm. I grew up on a, I'm a fifth generation farmer here in the county. And when I bought our farm, uh, I was looking for something to do. Sure. And uh, we got into exotic animals, and we got into growing tobacco, and sure. and started the pumpkins. And when the people started coming for the pumpkins, we got to a certain spot, like about four or five acres, and we couldn't sell any more pumpkins. Yeah. So, how do you get more people out there? Well, people want to come. You know, people want to get back to the roots. A lot of right. you know, a lot of people are one or two generations from the farm. Right. Because of the 19th, early 19th century, 80% of our population was farming. Right. Now less than 2% of our population is farming. Wow. So when we plateaued at that, that seven, eight acres, the only way to get people to come was to add things for them to do. Right. And we started out with a bonfire, and we started out with, with uh, school tours, and then we put a corn maze in, and then we put a haunted hayride, and it just, and now we have jumping pillows, and we have pig races, and we have, uh, that's just, that's, it just keeps, you know, the, the backyard just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. yeah. Now, you talked about a haunted hayride, and you have a haunted forest. We have a haunted do. forest. Talk to us a little bit about how, what, what that is and how long it's been running. Well, this will be our 17th year haunting. Uh, our first uh, five years, we did a haunted hayride okay. with a community center and, and uh, had about 100 uh, actors come out. And in our fifth year, we decided to haunt our corn maze, too. So we had the two things going simultaneously. And the haunted hayride went away, and we did the corn maze for three years. Problem with the corn maze is we had a drought two of those three years, mm -hmm. and trying to scare people when the corn is only four feet tall <laughs> and you have a full moon right. is no fun. And I'm sitting there last year looking at you know, looking at my ho my woods, going, how can I get people down to that? Sure. So now we're in year whatever twelve, I think, for our haunted yeah, for haunted forest, and um, that has just grown phenomenally. We have a you get a, a hayride down to the haunted forest. Sure. We unceremoniously kick you off the wagon. You take a half mile walk through the, the forest and you get back on the wagon. Yeah. Sometimes you have, you know, dry pants, sometimes you don't. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. So, yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I went to some like haunted houses, but I think being kind of out in the woods would be a lot more scary than, than being in a haunted house necessarily. City so. people are used to night lights. Sure. They go out of their, their, their front steps. Yeah. The first thing we do to, to these city people is, we dump them off in the total darkness. There's right. a little light about 100 yards down the, down, down yeah. the path, and that just freaks them out. Yeah. I mean, we got them scared before we even get them to the first scene. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah I bet. Um, and we just have a few seconds left, but I want to make sure that I ask you this. You also do barn weddings. Can you talk to us real quickly about um, you know, how you handle those? Um, we, we have two different venues that we put people in. Uh, we have a centennial uh, round barn. Mm -hmm. um, Again, people want to go back to their roots. We have a lot of fun uh, sure. with, you know, bringing out, you know, old older things, the tractors. Sure. Uh, you get to see the gothic scene. Sure. Um, people just have a great time having their weddings at our farm. That's very cool. Don Schuster from Schuster's Playtime Farm, thank you so much for joining you us betcha. today. We'll look forward to getting out there. All right, thank you.
Don't go away. When we come back, we'll be talking with the South Central Library System. It's National Library Card Sign-Up Month. It's Talk of the Town. Don't go away. Welcome back to Talk of the Town. As the school year comes to a beginning, it's time to crack open those books. And if you do not have a library card, then this is the month to do it. It's National Library Card Sign-Up Month, and I'm now joined by Susan Santner, who is the director of the Oregon Public Library. Susan, welcome to the program. Well, thank you so much, Justin. I'm delighted to be here today. So talk to us about what a library card can do for a person. Well, a library card, like this is very similar to a credit card that sure. fits right into your wallet yeah. and a library card can give you access to information from around the world. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing what this little card can do. Um, it can provide internet access for free. You can um, choose to check out books. You can choose to check out um, magazines, uh, DVDs, mm -hmm. fiction and nonfiction, children's books, um, graphic novels for teens, almost anything you could imagine reading you can get at a public library with a little library card and it also allows access to um, electronic books and electronic magazines now Justin you can go through your library website and you can read a magazine on your computer at home that's very cool and I know yeah. when when, uh, when Marty was on the show and Martha was on the show a yes. while ago she mm -hmm. talked a little bit about that that's very very cool yeah. um, and the thing that I like to always uh, talk to I always think of uh, when I think of the library is that these are really our books these are our yes. materials yes exactly. and the library card just kind of it allows us access to what's really already ours I mean exactly yeah it's very cool so um, you know you you talked a little bit about what it can get you where can you use it do you have to go to the library to use it no that's what's so awesome about it just and because, you, of course, you can go to your public library right. and use your, your little library card, but you can also access anything you want from home with a library card. You put your number into the computer yeah. on the, through your library webpage, mm -hmm. and everything is open for you 24-7. You can have access to anything you want in the library from home. Very so, cool. And you can use these cards anywhere in the South Central Library System. Great. And there's 54 libraries in the whole system. Yeah. And there's 20 libraries right here in Dane County that this right. little card is good for. It. Right. Mm -hmm. D different branches here in Dane County. Different or, branches, yeah. exactly. In yeah. different, you know, the communities around Madison. That's very mm -hmm. cool. And, and how much does it cost to sign up for a library card? This little card is absolutely free. Yeah. All you need to do is go to your local library and register. Yeah. With one of the friendly librarians. That's all you have to do. And you get your card. Yeah, so. and, and I think there's, a, there's kind of a generation of people who maybe have not even thought of signing up for a library card that have never had a library card out there, which is a shame, and I think we need to kind of turn that around. Well, it would be great. That's why September is Library Card Sign-Up Month, yeah. and this year the spokesperson happens to be Snoopy. Oh, really? Charles Schultz's Snoopy is the chair for this year's Library Card Sign-Up Month. So um, there'll be bookmarks probably at your library that you can get with Snoopy on it. So, Talk to us a little bit about some of the other things that the library card can offer. Well, this library card also gives you access to um, lovely librarians who yes. can help you with your Such information. As yes, no. <laughs> you can go into your library and you can find out about um, your ancestors, yeah. and the librarian can help you. You can be a person looking for health information, and they can direct you to um, our our health area in the library. And if you're a four-year-old, you can go up to them and ask them for the blue book, and they will do their best to help you find them. And you can't get a librarian on Google. Oh, absolutely not. No. And I think, you know, a lot of people, that's the first thing that they think of, including myself, is that, you know, when I don't know something, well, I'll just Google it. But really, you know, the, the librarian has the expertise mm -hmm. and the knowledge to, to know where to find that accurate information. Accurate information is the key there, yes. Justin. And they are well-trained. They're professional. They've been to school. I mean, they have, you know, they've had classes on reference and all kinds of things, and they know the databases, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we've got about a minute left, oh. but you've got a, a guest that you brought who's been oh. kind of napping with. <laughs> With us and she's going to yes. read us a poem. I think, well, today. one of the neat things about the public library is that they also offer early literacy programs. Sure. So I brought my early literacy puppet with me. And, and um, who is this? What's her name? Oh, this is Emily. Well, hi, Emily. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> la 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 la. All right, oh, I'm Emily's sorry, warming up. Sing, actually, here she goes. All right. Readers reading, dreamers dreaming, get a card. Read
Emily and Susan Santer from the uh, Oregon Public Library. Thank <laughs> you so right. much for joining that's us. That's right. Bye, Justin. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Yeah. Don't go away. There's more Talk of the Town coming up right after this. Stick around. Welcome back to Talk of the Town. My next guest is Liz Henry from Henry Farms Prairie Spirits. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having us. So I'm really excited to um, see all this that you have here because uh, there's obviously a lot to talk about. Uh, you're going to be talking about a uh, Wisconsin straight bourbon, bourbon whiskey. And um, But first I want to get into this a little bit because you guys are seed corn producers. How did you get into producing whiskey? Well, bourbon by law yeah. has to be 51% or more corn. Okay. And seven years ago, my husband and I went down to Kentucky, went on the bourbon trail, really nice trip. I recommend it. Uh -huh. And we came home and said, we could make bourbon. It's a value-added product with our corn. Sure. That's so cool. this is an heirloom red seed corn okay. that was developed at the University of Wisconsin okay. in the 1930s. Yeah. And my husband contacted them and said, could we revive that breed mm -hmm. or that uh, cross of red corn? And sure. that is what goes into our mash bill. This is our mash bill. Okay. It's actually about 62% red corn, wheat, and rye. And then you add a little malt barley, and that's what makes bourbon. Wow. That's really interesting that you just kind of went down there and it dawned on you that, <laughs> hey, we could do this. I think it was mainly my husband. Sure. I mean, he's been a seed corn producer all of his life. Yeah. And he came home and said, gee, that would be much more fun. Right. <laughs> Hopefully it is. Now, the question that you get, and we were talking a little bit before uh, the, the show started, that the question that you often get is, hey, doesn't bourbon have to be made in Kentucky? And, of course, the answer is... No. There you go. Um, it's a great myth that's perpetuated by the Kentucky bourbon producers. Mm -hmm. They've done a really great job of both getting people to come to Kentucky sure. and believing that bourbon must be made in Kentucky. Right. But, in fact, bourbon can be made anywhere in the United States. Sure. And outside. Can it be made outside the United States? No, whiskey really? can, but not bourbon. Really? And as the old saw goes, all whiskeys are not bourbon, but all bourbons are whiskeys. Oh, got it. The okay. difference is that bourbon meets a higher standard. Okay. There are a lot of extra things that have to occur with a bourbon production. Mm -hmm. And that was mainly designed so that the moonshiners couldn't intrude onto the bourbon producer's um, business. That's very cool. So um, you actually won a gold medal in Louisville, Kentucky. Like a Wisconsinites going to Kentucky and winning a gold medal. That's impressive. And um, what's your next step now? Well, this was pretty exciting because the day we won the gold medal in Louisville was the day after Bo Ryan beat Louisville in the basketball finals. Oh, wow. So we really felt you really we represented. That salt in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. But now we're submitting um, samples to additional award competitions mm -hmm. and hoping that we can continue producing a really good quality product. Later this month, we will be coming out with our cask strength product, which is straight out of the barrel, full strength product. Wow. So you guys have a tasting room. Talk to us a little bit about what a visit to the tasting room is like. Well, what we try to do is explain some of the differences and the reasons that bourbon itself is differentiated, um, the reason that it's such a treat and such a special opportunity to drink a yellow or amber liquor. Mm -hmm. And then we do a little tasting, a little sample, a little tour, and we can also make cocktails with our J. Henry bourbon. Do you feel like there's anything that actually, I mean, obviously you won a gold medal, so there must be something that makes you unique, even from, um, you know, folks who are doing it down in Kentucky. What do you think that is? I think it has a lot to do with the fact that my husband has been a seed corn producer all of his life, and he puts those same exacting standards into producing all of the inputs, as well as producing a quality product that he works very hard to keep all the variables similar so that when you are tasting our bourbon, you are really enjoying it and rewarding yourself. The other thing is all of our bourbons will be at least five years aged in large casks, which is the old-fashioned slow way of aging. 
there is so much that goes into producing uh, a quality beverage like this. It's just amazing to me. So <laughs> I really appreciate all the information. And um, really quickly before we go, how does one reward themselves <laughs> with J. Henry? Well, this is called a Glencairn glass. Okay. And in a Glencairn glass, this is what we give samples and tastings mm -hmm. for at our tasting room. Sure. You're supposed to hold the stem. Okay. It's built so that there's more oxygen around sure. the belly okay. and that the aromas are wafting up to your nose. Sure. So I'm going to ask you to I'm just, just smell. sniff <laughs> it. Yeah. And what do you smell? It's It definitely smells sweeter than I would expect. Sweeter, but sweet like a vanilla, like a tar toffee or a caramel? I would say more like vanilla. That comes from the corn. Interesting. Um, rye whiskey is mostly rye. Yeah. And then there are heavily weeded whiskeys. Ours is mostly corn. And this heirloom red corn has a carbohydrate complex that really gives it that sweet aroma. Well, Liz, we could talk about this for a long <laughs> time, but unfortunately we're out of time. So, but I appreciate you coming on today and Thank for you. giving us all the information. Thank you, Justin. That's all the time we have for Talk of the Town. We'll see you next time. <laughs>